My dear brothers and sisters, Elder Gilbert and I are pleased to be speaking to you today. However, just two days after President Nelson's historic address to many of you who are young adults, we want to reinforce his message as we begin. As we listen to President Nelson's inspired counsel on Sunday evening, including the truth of who we are and the destiny God has designed for us, we thought we should reaffirm what he said. He taught us the foundation for all that young adults and others should be doing. Our messages build on President Nelson's foundation, which we reverently endorse. We live in perilous times when evil is being called good and good is being called evil. We must stand fast against the values and practices that draw us away from the Lord's teachings and our covenants, privileges, and obligations. We can do this with love. Elder Gilbert, how do we stand fast with love? Thank you, President Oaks. The first thing we'd ask of all of you is to have the quiet strength of a disciple of Jesus Christ. You can look to the example of Jesus Christ in his patterns of standing fast with love. Take the case of the Samaritan woman at the well or the calling of the publican as one of Christ's disciples. He knew their shortcomings and their weaknesses. Importantly, they knew their shortcomings and their weaknesses. Nevertheless, he treated them with love while he taught them truth. Rather than condemning others, we should simply proclaim what we know and what we believe and invite others to follow the Savior. It is their opportunity to choose, not ours to compel. Now, President Oaks, you said we face perilous times. Apostle Paul used that phrase, and in the Doctrine and Covenants, we learned that the whole world would be in commotion as we prepared for the return of the Savior. Why would past and present prophets use such language to describe our day? Commotion. When I think of commotion, I think of wars and rumors of wars, global pandemics, global warming, the rising tide of evil in the world around us, and the anxiety that is increasing among us. Perilous times surely include the present circumstances that fulfill the scriptural concern that people would call evil and good evil. President Oaks, as you describe uh, seeing good being called evil and evil good, why are those arguments so persuasive to so many today? Evil is being called good and good is being called evil all around us today. Everyone here can think of many examples. I invite you to do so. Why is this upside down view so persuasive to many. There are many reasons, but three of them stand out in my mind. Some are persuaded to call evil good because of the false doctrine that we are not accountable to God for our behavior. This persuades some that there will be no eternal consequences for their actions, but we know from the scriptures that this is a false and vain and foolish doctrine. Second is the pervasive sense of intellectual supremacy that exists in society and especially in colleges and universities. President Spencer W. Kimball responded to this when he stated that we must become a bastion of righteousness 
resisting the, quote, invading ideologies that seek control of curriculum as well as classroom. We do not resist such ideas because we fear them, he said, but because they are false. The third influence is the tendency of those who call good evil to bully or shout down or put negative labels on those who disagree. They seek to intimidate them by shaming or silencing opposition to their untruths. Have you ever stood at the pulpit and had the experience of mixing up your pages? <laughs> well, be my witness while I suffer through that indignity. <laughs> I think we're on to this question, President. Thank um, you. I'm Gilbert. being saved. <laughs> <laughs> we all need a friend. <laughs> Elder Gilbert, let me turn the question to you. Why do the world's efforts to label good things evil persuade some of God's children to believe things that simply are not true? President Oaks, as you mentioned the three uh, reasons in your earlier remarks, I thought of Korihor in the Book of Mormon. It's interesting that Korihor is someone who did try to bully others' beliefs and make us feel foolish for the things we hold most dear. I'll read from Alma 30. Behold, these things which ye call prophecies, this is Korihor, he says, Behold, these things which ye call prophecies, which ye say are handed down by holy prophets, behold, they are the foolish traditions of your fathers. How do you know of their sure, assurity? Behold, you cannot know things which you do not see. Therefore, you cannot know there shall be a Christ. Korahor's arguments seek to belittle or embarrass belief. He tries to make the argument that we're bound by the prophets, that we're bound by tradition, and that we lack evidence for the things we believe. Only a fool would believe what we believe in the words of Korahor. Ironically, he doesn't note that in being bound by the prophets, we are tied up with someone who is directed by God to teach us truth. Being bound by tradition, points us to their commitment and their sacrifice for our lives. And in citing that we don't have evidence, he overlooks the very real experiences and spiritual evidence we have each had in our own lives. I'm not saying that rational argument is the source of personal conversion, but I do fall with C.S. Lewis's Professor Diggory Kirk when he observed the Pensavy children not believing their sister. He said, logic, what do they teach in these schools? The irony is that Korahor suffers from his own logical fallacies, which he eventually confesses to at the end of Alma 30. He says, but behold, the devil hath deceived me. He has said unto me, there is no God, and I have taught his words, and I have taught them because they were pleasing unto the carnal mind. And I taught them, even until I had much success, insomuch that verily I believe they were truth. This is what's known as the illusory truth effect. Korahor has repeated his own arguments so many times that he's actually grown to believe them. This is also similar to what could be called the bandwagon effect, where we're taught by Korahor and others that everyone else gets this, and you don't, you believers who are foolish and vain, you don't see what is really true that so many other people see. As I think about this bandwagon effect, I think of an experience I had watching people be torn by pressure from others. 
Let's watch this short clip from Candid Camera to show what can happen to us if we only take the influence of the world. The gentleman in the elevator now is a candid star. These folks who are entering, the man with the white shirt, the lady with the trench coat, and subsequently one other member of our staff will face the rear. And you'll see how this man in the trench coat <laughs> tries to maintain his individuality, but little by little, he looks at his watch, but he's really making an excuse for turning just a little bit more to the wall. Now we try it once again. Here's the candid subject. Here comes the candid camera staff, three of them at least. And uh, this man has apparently been in groups before. <laughs> now, here's a fella with his hat on in the elevator. First, he makes a full turn to the rear, and Charlie closes the door. A moment later, we'll open the door. Everybody's changed positions. <laughs> now we'll see if we can use... Now we'll see if we can use group pressure for some good. Now, in a moment, on Charlie's signal, everybody turns forward. There is, notice, they take off their hats. And now, do you think we could reverse the procedure? Watch. Despite the humor of that video, you are going to have to learn to turn and face the right way in the elevator, even when everyone else is telling you to turn around and face the back. In your heart, you'll know this can't be the right thing they're doing, but you have to have the courage to stand fast, looking in the right direction. Now, President Oaks, in the last three general conferences, you have spoken about issues related to the family, religion, and the Constitution. What is it about these institutions that are so important to the church? Thank you. The family is a core institution of civil society. As we read in the family proclamation, it is, quote, central to the creator's plan for the eternal destiny of his children, unquote. Of course, the adversary will attack such a central part of the plan and try to persuade the children of God to depart from it. Religion. Religion stands as a firewall against the adversary's onslaughts on many other key institutions or ideas in the world. We know from experience that the teachings and practices of religion strengthen society generally including such needs as humanitarian assistance, law observance, the ability of individual citizens to act for the benefit of the overall community, and the effectiveness of other democratic institutions. As for the Constitution, the Constitutional Bill of Rights guarantees protect the good that religious believers and their churches, synagogues, and mosques can do. These protections include the precious freedoms of speech, conscience, and the free exercise of religion. I've spoken often on this subject in this country and in other countries. It's vital to all of us to understand the importance of these protections and our democratic form of government. Well, President Oaks, uh, 
speaking of these three institutions and other truths that we seek to defend, what are ways that you would like to see our young adults in the church stand fast with love in proclaiming truth? I have uh, a number of things I would like to urge you to do. The first is avoid overly contentious settings. I encourage you to refrain from participating in the contentious communications that are so common today. Social media can generate conflicts. It can expand the audience and the speed of dissemination. It often fosters careless charges, false representations, and ugly innuendos that intensify the distance between different parties and their communications. I'm not criticizing differences in policies. These need to be debated publicly. What I'm urging our members to do is to stand clear from the current atmosphere of hate and personal meanness in communications. I loved Elder Neil L. Anderson's recent statement that, quote, there are times when being a peacemaker means that we resist the impulse to respond and instead with dignity remain quiet. There's great wisdom in that counsel. Second suggestion, love others, find common ground even when we disagree. After avoiding contentious settings, we should reach out positively to express our concern and love for those with whom we disagree. We should seek to find common ground on which to stand with those who might otherwise consider us their enemies. Followers of Christ should be examples of civility. We should remember the Savior's teachings. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. As President Thomas S. Monson taught us in one of his last conference messages, we should, quote, we should show, quote, our love in day-to-day -day interactions. Love is the very essence of the gospel, the noblest attribute of the human soul." End of quote. We should also hold to truth even in our outreach to others. Loving those with different views and avoiding contention are both examples of civility, and they do not mean we should refrain from participating in discussions, debates, and even asking, taking positions against what we believe to be wrong or inadvisable. For example, our voices should be heard on the importance of religion and religious freedom for all citizens, believers and non-believers alike. We can do this if we avoid contentious settings and speak in the context of respect with those with whom we disagree. Another suggestion, another counsel, is to be a light to the world. Show the world you, what you can do that is good as a disciple of Jesus Christ. For behold, it is not meat that I should command in all things, the Lord said to us in the Doctrine and Covenants. For he that is compelled in all things, the same is a slothful and not a wise servant. Wherefore, he receiveth no reward. Verily, I say, men should be anxiously engaged in a good cause and do many things of their own free will and bring to pass much righteousness. That's the end of that quote from the Doctrine and Covenants. Another, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Here's another, stay anchored in Jesus Christ. 
One of the most important ways to be a light to the world is to keep the commandments of God. I plead with each of you not to seek happiness in the glittering temptations and attractions of the world. Wickedness can never lead to lasting happiness or eternal joy. In these critical times of your lives, you need to anchor your life in the Savior. President Nelson has said, quote, My dear brothers and sisters, these are the latter days. If you and I are, in, are to withstand the forthcoming perils and pressures, it is imperative that we each have a firm spiritual foundation built upon the rock of our Redeemer. End of quote. This means that you find time to set yourself apart from the world. President Nelson has suggested this can be done through regular temple attendance, reading the scriptures, and staying anchored to our covenants, such as keeping the Sabbath day holy. These practices will help us focus our thoughts on the Savior and what he has done for us by his atonement, which gives us the assurance of immortality and the opportunity for eternal life. In this way, we will have the defense promised in modern revelation, where we are told, quote, take the shield of faith wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Now, Elder Gilbert, I have this practical request in behalf of our audience. Please apply these ideas to issues that often polarize our young adults to keep them from standing fast in proclaiming truth. Thank you, President Oates. Let me just start with one, and I'll note at the outset, part of our challenge in doing this is to stand fast when truths are mixed with untruths. Take the example or the case of prophetic direction. It is true that we do not have a doctrine of prophetic infallibility. Moses wasn't perfect. Joseph Smith wasn't perfect. Only Jesus Christ was perfect. But that does not mean that our prophetic calls and our prophets are not called of God, or that we can pick and choose what prophetic direction we will follow. God calls, elevates, and qualifies those who he has chosen. Look at the pattern of the first vision. When God came to earth with his son, he said, this is my beloved son, hear him. Christ then turned to the prophet Joseph in the Doctrine and Covenants and followed that same pattern. In Doctrine and Covenants 43, we read, for behold, ye have received a commandment unto my church through him whom I have appointed unto you, and this ye shall know assuredly, that there is none other appointed unto you to receive commandment and revelations on behalf of the church. In the preface to the Doctrine and Covenants, we read, whether it is by mine own voice or by the voice of my servants, it is the same. We can apply these and other examples of difficult issues in our days using the five points that President Oaks has outlined. Thank you. Brothers and sisters, I now address the subject of race. We must start in dealing with this subject by recognizing the very real challenges of racism, by condemning ongoing racial prejudice and by strengthening those who continue to face unfair biases. On this point, we are aligned with and can learn from many secular efforts to reduce racism. We have done this in our efforts to work with the NAACP and other community organizations. Please also recall <coughs> the church's repeated pleas to abandon actions and attitudes of prejudice. President Nelson has taught, quote, each of us has a divine potential 
because each is a child of God. Each is equal in his eyes. God does not love one race more than another. I call upon our members everywhere to lead out in abandoning attitudes and actions of prejudice. That's the end of the quote from our prophet. One way our common ground with others can be undermined is if any contending party sows division and separates communities. In condemning and working against racism, we encourage our students, our teachers, and all our members to avoid extreme or polarizing positions and teachings that undermine the U.S. Constitution and other core institutions. We know that the Constitution was inspired of God, despite its birth defect of slavery. Its inspired principles, including the freedoms of speech and religion, and its authorized amendments have allowed subsequent generations to continue to improve and strengthen the rights of all of its citizens. That is part of our history and it should not be distorted by trying to substitute other motivations for the Constitution of the United States as some are doing in our time. A gospel-centered approach to combating racism empowers all parties to support, apply, and teach the power and light of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The church has made this positive approach in its efforts, both within its membership and with outside organizations. I point to our work with the NAACP as just one example. Reverend Thomas Amos Brown is a noted civil rights leader and a friend of President Russell M. Nelson. He recently wrote this, quote, we can gripe about the way things were. We can refuse to acknowledge all the good going on now. But these approaches will not heal our national divisions. As Jesus taught, we don't eradicate evil with more evil. We love generously and live mercifully even toward those we think to be our enemies. That's the end of the quote from Reverend Amos Brown. Again, listen to Reverend Brown's more recent remarks at the Washington, D.C. Temple Open House. Mr. Joseph Smith, the first prophet, also ran for the presidency of the United States in 1844. But the major plank in his platform was the abolition of slavery by 1850. Thus, thus, preceding Mr. Abraham Lincoln, even before he exhibited the courage to sign that Emancipation Proclamation. But fast forward to 2021. Thank God that one President Nelson lived out the intent and the spirit of Joseph Smith when he reached out to the NAACP and said, we want to talk, we want to have conversation, we want to be enlightened about each other's experiences. And I assure you that if all of the so-called religious groups in this nation would follow the example of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. We shall save the soul of America. Elder Gilbert, what do you add on this important well, subject? Well, I, I love Reverend Brown's message of reconciliation and his hand of friendship to the church. Uh, President Oaks, I also appreciate your call to help us eliminate attitudes of racism without falling to secular agendas that seek to divide and even polarize. Elder Mark Palmer, the former area president in South Africa, recently reminded us of Nobel Peace Prize recipient Nelson Mandela 
and his efforts to end uh, his country's system of racial segregation. Older Palmer explained at a recent BYU graduation that despite being in prison for nearly 30 years, Nelson Mandela chose to focus on reconciliation and truth rather than on bitterness or revenge. He is famously reported to have said, quote, resentment is like drinking poison and then hoping it will kill your enemies. What an inspiring, inspiring example of Christ-like leadership. In a more modest way, I think of my own experience observing the church's youth in inner city Boston here in the United States. These young men I served with for more than a decade faced ignorant attitudes, sometimes even from members of the church. But they also knew that it was the church that gave them the confidence to overcome so many of their challenges. It was the church that encouraged youth leaders to invest in their lives. These Boston youth were determined not to let polarizing agendas separate them from the very church that would present them with mentors, spiritual opportunities, and the education they needed to succeed. Today, these young men are return missionaries, married in the temple, leading productive lives in the church and in their careers. I know that here at Ensign College that more than 50% of our students have a multicultural background. At BYU Hawaii, more than 60% of our students are from Asia and the Pacific. At BYU Pathway Worldwide, we have served already more than 10,000 students in Africa. We are well acquainted with students of diverse social and cultural backgrounds in the church. The church educational system is helping all of its six students succeed in ways that embrace their different backgrounds, cultures, and races. If any of you have faced attitudes of prejudice, know that you are part of a church that is striving to root out racism, both within the church and across society. You are part of a church that believes in you, will provide you opportunities to grow in the gospel of Jesus Christ, and is committed to your education and your future success. Thank you, Commissioner Gilbert. <clears throat> Let us turn next to issues related to same-sex attraction. Here, too, there are some untruths we should lovingly oppose. As with issues of race, the church has reached out in good faith to build bridges. Through its support of the Fairness for All initiative, the church is supporting rights for LGBTQ individuals in housing and health care, while we also preserve our own basic rights of conscience and freedom of religion. In an address I gave last year at the University of Virginia, I described a way to resolve differences without compromising core values. In seeking common ground, we encourage fair treatment and respect for others and we ask the same for ourselves. Showing respect does not mean we walk away from our beliefs and fundamental doctrine on the family and its importance to God's plan for the eternal destiny of his children as revealed in the family proclamation. Please remember the responsibility we members of the First Presidency and Quorum of the Twelve have as apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ, we must declare the truth as God has revealed it. We are not free to pick and choose which truths we will preach and defend. As the Savior said to his apostles, if the world hates you, ye know that it hated me before it hated you. If ye were of the world, the world would love its own, but because ye are not of the world, but I have chosen ye out of the world, therefore the world hateth you." End of quote. We must show love in the way we teach truth, but we must nevertheless continue to teach truth. President Nelson gave an example of this in his talk Sunday evening. 
Speaking of our first identity, he taught, quote, there are various labels that may be very important to you, of course. Please do not misunderstand me. I am not saying that other designations and identifiers are not significant. I'm simply saying that no identifier should displace, replace, or take priority over these three enduring designations, child of God, child of the covenant, and disciple of Jesus Christ. That's the end of the quote from President Nelson. President Oaks, in your recent University of Virginia lecture, you counseled against being unduly influenced by voices that polarize or sow resentment. There is a difference between experiencing same-sex attraction and acting in ways that violate our covenants. Many frame LGBTQ issues as an all or nothing Hobson's choice. In other words, they say to be loving to our LGBTQ friends, you must promote behaviors that violate sacred covenants. Or they say to be loyal to our church, you must ignore the reality of same-sex attraction and condemn those who experience it. Both statements are wrong. As Elder Jeffrey R. Holland has taught, quote, as near as I can tell, Christ never once withheld his love from anyone. But he also never once said, because I love you, ye are exempt from keeping my commandments. We are tasked with trying to strike that same sensitive, demanding balance in our lives. Notice the pattern of the Savior when he compassionately stood up for the woman taken in adultery. He reminded her public accusers it was not their role to judge. He, even private, he then privately charged her to go and sin no more. We receive guidance on this balance in the Church Handbook of Instructions. The Church encourages families and members to reach out with sensitivity, love, and respect to persons who are attracted to others of the same sex. The church also promotes understanding of society at large that reflects its teachings about kindness, inclusiveness, love for others, and respect for other, all human beings. Let me be clear that individuals or groups who do not treat our LGBTQ members with empathy and charity are not aligned with the teachings of the Church of Jesus Christ. At the same time, Ignoring God's laws has never been the Savior's pattern for showing love. Remember, Jesus asked us to love God first. Elder D. Todd Christofferson taught why the sequence matters. He said, putting the first commandment first does not diminish or limit our ability to keep the second commandment. To the contrary, it amplifies and strengthens it. Our love of God elevates our ability to love others more fully and perfectly because we, in essence, partner with God in the care of his children. I have felt this. I know God loves all of his children. Please know of our admiration for so many students who are striving to live their covenants and respect the principles of the honor code. We recognize your commitment and we appreciate your example. We welcome you. We want you to feel a sense of belonging as we work together to be true to the teachings of the Church of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Elder Gilbert. I say a hearty amen to what you have said. It's now time for us to conclude this time we've spent together. I remind you of a few key ideas that we have taught. We can trust in the great promises of the Lord. If we are prepared, we shall not fear. The Lord has prepared a way for us to accomplish what he desires us and commands us to do. Today, I have mentioned five ways to help you stand fast with love in proclaiming the truth. Avoid overly contentious settings. Love others even when we disagree. 
hold to truth even as we reach out to others, be a light to the world, and stay anchored in Jesus Christ. As we have concluded, we've also given you some valuable counsel on how to communicate effectively and lovingly on some of the important current issues of our day. Finally, we assure you that with the help of the Lord, you can do this in powerful and loving ways. Now, Elder Gilbert, would you like to offer a concluding testimony? Thank you, I will. I'll share my remarks and then I'll yield the podium back to you and let you finish. First of all, we hope each of you will carry the quiet strength of a disciple of Jesus Christ. President Oaks walked through those five points, but I just reemphasize once again his last point, stay anchored in Jesus Christ. I read this quote recently from President Nelson. The Lord has declared that despite today's unprecedented challenges, those who build their foundation upon Jesus Christ and have learned to draw on his power need not to succumb to the unique anxieties of this era. I used to read that in a very practical way, that this staying anchored in Christ will help us preserve our testimony. I believe that is true. But I also believe when we stay anchored in Jesus Christ, we will have the character and spirit and demeanor to interact with others in proclaiming truth with love. I know that Jesus Christ is our example. I look to him in all we do. I am so grateful for his love and his teachings, and I pray that each of us can stand fast with love in proclaiming truth. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. Thank you, Elder Gilbert. Brothers and sisters, I am one who has been called to testify of the name of Jesus Christ in all the world. This is more than to testify of Christ which all of us are to do because we have received the gift of the Holy Ghost whose mission is to testify of the Father and the Son. To testify of the name of Jesus Christ is the added responsibility to testify of his work, his atonement, his great mission to be the light and life of the world and to testify of the restored gospel which contains the teaching of the destiny that God our eternal Father has established for each of us as his children, for all who will become adopted into the covenant and promises of ancient Israel. I testify that our prophet, President Nelson, is inspired of the Lord in teaching us as he is taught so frequently that gathering scattered Israel, those who have this covenant in their DNA and those who desire to enter into that covenant is to gather scattered Israel and that we are responsible to do that. We can only do that if we stand fast in the truth of the great principles of the restored gospel revealed through the prophet Joseph Smith and the holy and sacred mission of the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray that each of us will be blessed to remember these great principles and these great responsibilities as taught by the servants of the Lord of whom I have spoken. I testify of Jesus Christ. I testify of his name, his work, his priesthood, and his mission in all the world of which we are all the beneficiaries. And I do so in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.